gumdrop, slang for this Apollo 9 command and service module. The spider, for rather obvious reasons, the nickname for this lunar module, the strangest spaceship of all, and the one this Apollo 9 flight is all about. Let's go back a few hours to the events leading up to this piggyback launch of two spacecraft aboard a single Saturn V rocket. That spacecraft commander McDivitt at breakfast with his crew, the standard pre-launch fare of steak and scrambled eggs. Suiting up, Rusty Schweikert, looking like a cheerful astronaut on this delayed launch day. Command module pilot Scott, lonesome Dave, who stayed behind or stays behind when the others transfer to the LEM. The astronauts were a few minutes late getting out to the van, but that's only the only event that was off schedule this morning, unless you count the rocket, which left the pad just 62 ten thousandths of a second after it was supposed to. The last man over the catwalk to Apollo was Dave Scott. He flies the middle couch and has to wait till his side men settle in. Our last look for a while at the men of Apollo 9 just before the hatch swung to, and we waited for the spectacle now familiar, still awesome, of a Saturn V launch. Now here is Frank Reynolds. Good evening. The Apollo 9 astronauts are orbiting the Earth tonight after a perfect launch from Cape Kennedy this morning. This afternoon, in a delicate and very important maneuver, the astronauts docked with their lunar module. Secretary of State Rogers said today... From the moment the Apollo 9 astronauts left their quarters for the launch pad early this morning, everything went smoothly and on schedule. For a report on America's most complex space mission to date, here is ABC science editor Jules Bergman at Cape Kennedy. If all of Apollo 9 goes as well as today's liftoff, America stands an excellent chance of landing men on the moon by this summer. After being delayed three days by the colds of astronauts Jim McDivitt, Dave Scott, and Rusty Schweiker, today's countdown was flawless. And precisely at 11 a.m. Eastern time, the huge Saturn V spewed flame and thundered into life. Ten, nine, we have this ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, Three. All engines commit the staff. We have Houston standard time. the Saturn V shook the cape, the rocket disappeared into heavy clouds, then emerged, burning beautifully, to be picked up by the telescopic lenses aboard the Air Force's jet tracking plane, flying eight miles over the Atlantic. All stages burned perfectly, putting Apollo 9 and the lunar module on its very first test flight into an orbit 119 miles high. A gauge failure and a late clock start throwing off the onboard computer were temporary worries. But the computer proved to be all right, and Apollo 9 was cleared to orbit on, beginning its very complex 10-day flight. Three hours after liftoff, Apollo 9 separated from its third stage S-4B rocket, and astronauts McDivitt, Scott, and Schweikert went to work. First, they turned the Apollo command module around, and then began moving in to link up with the lunar module, still attached to the third stage rocket. After checking everything closely, they docked with the lunar module, then extracted it or pulled it away from the rocket stage. That critical maneuver was the very first step in the testing out of the lunar module, or LM, the major goal of Apollo 9. Tomorrow, McDivitt and Schweikert crawl into the LEM through a tunnel connecting the two spacecraft, and then Thursday, Schweikert performs a two-hour spacewalk. Then they'll separate from the LEM, pull 100 miles away, and rendezvous and dock using the LEM's engines. Apollo 9, a critical flight, telling America just when we'll get to the moon. And it's off to a good start. This is Jules Bergman, ABC, reporting from Cape Kennedy. After the launch today, President Nixon said the flight of Apollo 9 can serve to bring humanity closer by dramatically showing what men can do when they bring to any task the best of man's mind and heart. Just prior to the launch this morning, the president uh, made a telephone call to Mrs. McDivitt and told her, we have great admiration for you and your husband. He also asked Mrs. McDivitt to convey his best wishes to Mrs. 
think that anyone having chocolate brownies, applesauce, and orange drink for breakfast was bound to have a bad day. But things have been going very well for astronauts. Given Scott Well, the only thing bothering him was all the oxygen hoses in the cockpit. Hey, Smokey. Uh, go. Have you ever been attacked by a band of wild elephants? Uh, negative. You ought to see what it looks like here with these six big black hoses. <laughs> uh, Rod, copy. Do you ever dream about octopus? Despite Scott's dreams, the astronauts slept well overnight. Three times today, they burned their main spacecraft engine to test control of the combined vehicles. The astronauts said it went more smoothly than in their ground simulators. At the moment, the only cloud on the horizon seems to be on two of the spacecraft windows. The same fogging experienced on earlier flights now noticed on the rendezvous window, the one they must see out of for their link-up Friday. For now, at least, no one seems too worried. David Schumacher, CBS News Space Headquarters, New York. The astronauts may have slept well, but not without interruption. They complained about extraneous radio signals over their headsets during the night, perhaps coming from an Air Force ground control tower somewhere in Vietnam. Incidentally, the space agency said today that it is considering having future astronauts mount a television camera on the moon. So if you... The Apollo 9 astronauts this evening are orbiting the Earth smoothly through the second day of their 10-day mission. It's been a busy day. The command module and the lunar landing craft remain linked, and there has been a successful test establishing that they can stay linked under stress. In a word, the Apollo 9 mission remains go. Radio Peking prepare for the first manned tests with the moon module tomorrow. Details now from ABC science editor Jules Bergman. Astronauts Jim McDivitt, Dave Scott, and Rusty Schweikert, flying the world's largest and heaviest spacecraft, today fired themselves into a higher orbit and fishtailed Apollo and the lunar module through space to see how firmly they were docked. Early today, after all three astronauts had slept soundly for more than nine hours, they fired up Apollo's big onboard engine for the second time. Twice more they fired up the engine, raising their orbit and wagging the two spacecraft together to see how they handled. Tomorrow morning, as in this animation, McDivitt and Schweikert will crawl through the tunnel joining the two spacecraft to begin checking out the lunar bug before Schweikert performs his two-hour spacewalk and the LM attempts to rendezvous and dock with Apollo Thursday and Friday. They'll be doing this in Earth orbit, of course, not as depicted here around the moon. A second goal in today's engine burns was to lighten the weight of the command module in case it has to rescue the LEM. The two spacecraft together are more than 58 feet long and weigh more than 35 tons. With the exception of a few minor glitches and some window fogging, all systems aboard Apollo 9 are working perfectly. The path now seems to be clear for the first docking of two U.S. manned spacecraft. Tomorrow morning, the first live television from the lunar module. This is Jules Bergman reporting. Paul Henney of the Space Agency said today that sometime in the future, astronauts may mount a television camera on the moon. That, of course, would enable us to see a blast-off back toward Earth. ABC will televise tomorrow's broadcast from Apollo 9 live, beginning at about 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Here's from space today and tested the lunar module designed to land men on the moon. Two of the men spent several hours inside the lunar bug. This is William Jones. The lunar module designed to land our astronauts on the moon received its first tests in space today, and it worked. As planned, the astronauts sent back live television pictures from the module, but the day was not without its problems. ABC science editor Jules Bergman reports. This is the way it is inside the lunar bug, and these pictures were beamed live early today after Rusty Schweikert on the left and Jim McDivitt had floated into the LEM through the tunnel from the command module. Despite nausea and vomiting, Schweikert was able to check out the LEM alone. After bad voice signals at first, McDivitt came through loud and clear. How are you, how are you reading me right now? Oh, we're reading you loud and clear, uh, Spider. Okay, I guess we're just not getting out of... Uh... On the box or something, uh, gumdrop's reading me all right, but you weren't. Okay, I'm not reading gumdrop at all, uh, and I am reading you uh, loud and clear now, and the TV picture has been real good. Okay, well, then I have the, uh, well, I'm being talking to the front now. Okay, uh, how do you read now, uh, Uh, Cliff? 
it's, uh, you're coming through loud and clear, Rusty. Uh, it's real good. After the TV, they fired up the Lunar Bug's descent engine, the one that has to land astronauts on the moon in future flights. The big engine, the first that can be throttled for manned flights, performed perfectly, changing the path of the two dock spacecraft over the Earth. The big question now is, will Schweikert be able to perform his two-hour spacewalk tomorrow? If he should become nauseous and vomit in a spacesuit with a closed helmet, it could be fatal. The final decision won't be made until tomorrow morning. The medics are unlikely to let Schweikert attempt the spacewalk if they feel there's any chance of his becoming ill. But the second live TV show from inside the LEM may take place even if the EVA is dropped. Apollo 9 into its third day in orbit. Both spacecraft performing beautifully despite the return of the strange nausea that has bugged earlier Apollo flights. This is Jules Bergman at ABC Space Headquarters. ABC will cover astronaut Schweikert's walk in space tomorrow live at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time if the walk takes place. Our walk in space by astronaut Russell Schweikert is in jeopardy tonight as illness has once again struck at the flight of Apollo 9. Schweikert reported to NASA ground officials in Houston this morning that he was sick and vomiting. But the nausea passed and Schweikert was able to make the scheduled transfer from the command module to the attached lunar landing craft. Later today, Schweikert took an anti-nausea and anti-diarrhea pill. For a report on today's events, here is Nelson Benton with Chief Astronaut Physician Dr. Charles Berry at the Houston Space Center. And then David Schumacher at CBS News Space Headquarters in New York. Doctor, getting right to the flight of Apollo 9 and Russell Schweikert, how sick is he? Well, it's impossible to tell right now then exactly how sick he is. Well, all we really know at the moment is that uh, he has had some nausea and vomited on two occasions, and that was this morning. Since that time, he's carried out a good deal of activity in the flight plan, carried out most of the flight plan activities that were online for today. And we hope to get a better reading on that here within the next few hours and, and make our decisions about tomorrow. Schweikert requested a pill for motion sickness before launch. How, how long before launch did he ask for that? Was this a spur of the moment thing, or was he worried about motion sickness? No, he was worried about motion sickness. He, Rusty has had some motion sickness occur uh, in some of the uh, zero-G aircraft flights, which is not unusual. This happens to uh, a lot of people because of the positive and negative G mixed with some zero-G. Uh, and the warmness of the, uh, inside the aircraft. He also uh, had, had had some of the same sort of motion sickness of a different type really on the water in egress exercise, and that's not uncommon among our people also, even after some of the missions we've observed this, of course. So uh, while these episodes uh, seemed very prominent to him, he decided that he would be better off to be prepared in view of the experience of the Apollo 8 crew where they had this early in the flight. It, it would seem that perhaps this might have contributed one way or, or another, perhaps against selecting him for extravehicular activity, and yet apparently it did not. Can you explain that? No, I don't, I don't think so, because uh, we haven't felt that he was that that prone to any more necessarily prone to motion sickness than some of our other crewmen have been, because it's a different type. He can fly all sorts of acrobatic maneuvers and things of that sort without any sense of motion sickness whatsoever. Schweikert's upset stomach this morning delayed the checkout of the lunar module for 80 minutes. But finally, the astronauts were given permission to remove the tunnel hardware, clearing the crawlway into the limb. A complicated process described by engineer Leo Krupp at our North American simulator. As soon as the, uh, the umbilicals are stowed, then he takes the actuating handle and releases the probe, which collapses it. He then releases the capture latches by turning the knob on the on the end of the probe and he's then free to pull the probe away from the drogue and bring it into the command module. Now this piece of hardware weighs 83 pounds and again it's not difficult to handle but you do have to move it slowly. Now this is handed to Rusty Swigart who stowed it underneath the right couch. The only thing holding the two vehicles together at this time are the 12 capture latches that are engaged around the, the, the docking rings. The last piece of tunnel hardware to be removed is the, the drogue itself, and uh, that is very simple to remove. You just release a lock and turn it about 10 degrees, and it comes free. He then has to turn it 90 degrees to line it up, and it just barely fits between the tunnel ring, and he also brings that into the command module. 
The astronauts turned on their television cameras soon after they entered the LEM. Rusty Schweiker to the left, Jim McDivitt in the foreground. Dave Scott, of course, remained behind in the mothership. The seven-minute TV broadcast was good, except for audio problems. The astronauts had trouble with their microphones, but they didn't seem to want to say anything anyway. However, they really do use the term spider and gumdrop to refer to the LEM and command module, a relief to reporters who said they would and then waited two days without hearing them use the words once. Satisfied that all systems were working properly, Jim McDivitt then turned on the LEM's descent engine, the one which will gently lower men to the surface of the moon. It burned so smoothly that halfway through the six-minute test, McDivitt talked mostly about how hungry he was. The astronauts have left the LEM and rejoined Scott in the command ship. The question now is about tomorrow's spacewalk. It could be postponed one day or even canceled if Schweikert is not up to it. Officials will review the situation through the night. David Schumacher, CBS News, Space Headquarters, New York. A small fire broke out today in the boiler room of the prime recovery ship for Apollo 9, the helicopter carrier Guadalcanal. The fire was quickly extinguished. Oh. Apollo 9 continued in orbit around the Earth today, and its crew performed the most dramatic and delicate job so far of the 10-day mission. Russell Schweikert and Colonel James McDivitt moved through a narrow tunnel from the command ship into the odd-shaped moon landing vehicle, and from there they broadcast to the Earth from a fixed television camera. Communications were bad, and most of the time the men could not be heard. Schweikert, on the left, was the first to enter the lunar landing ship, and it took some doing. Only hours before, he had been sick to his stomach. He was joined by Colonel McDivitt, and they left behind Colonel David Scott to pilot the command ship. Schweiker turned on the power, oxygen, and other systems. Then he and McDivitt went about finding out whether the delicate, thin-skinned machine could indeed do the job for which it was intended, that is, landing men on the moon. They let down its four spindly legs, and finally they fired the engine which will make the spacecraft descend to the moon. All that done, the men returned to the command module, their day a success. And Dr. Thomas Paine, who has been acting head of the space agency, today got the job officially. He was appointed by President Nixon, who said that he had searched the country for the right man and found he was in the program already. David? The West Germans elected a president named Gustav. Astronaut Russell Schweikert's walk in space, scheduled for tomorrow, was canceled tonight. He was to have walked between the command module and the moon landing ship, but he had two stomach upsets today, and Colonel James McDivitt told the ground controllers that Schweikert simply was not up to it.